was back in the back on the last song, and uh, I like kind of squatted down, and I was just like praying, and uh, I started to feel myself slip back, and I realized I was falling back, and I almost like flipped the table with all of the small group things. So <laughs> I thought I'd let you guys in on that before we start. Uh, but again, welcome. So we're going to start um, 1 Corinthians tonight. Um, last year, we went through the book of Romans, um, and, and both written by Paul. Um, the book of Romans is kind of Paul's uh, theological, doctrinal uh, masterpiece. And uh, one of the things that we talked a little bit about last year is that with going through all of that deep theology is that our theology always has to translate into action. It always has to translate into practice, right? And if it doesn't, then your theology is wrong. Or if it translates into practice that's wrong, then your theology is wrong, right? And so following off of this deep theology, theological book, um, we decided to go with uh, the book of 1 Corinthians, uh, which is essentially Paul writing to a church that has a lot of problems. Um, and he starts out kind of nice, but then he jumps right into, don't do this, do this better. Um, this is how it's currently happening. Do it this way. Don't do this, don't do this, don't do this. And so uh, a very practical book, a very ap applicable book. And uh, hopefully that that's, that's what we're going to see um, as, we, as we go through the book of 1 Corinthians this, this school year. Um, so I want to start with a little illustration. Um, how many of you guys ever had your dad go on like a business trip or even like a hunting trip? Gone for a while, right? Okay, yeah. So um, how many of you knew that when your dad was away, you could probably get away with a little bit more uh, because mom's busy running around, doesn't have time to put the fist down, right? And dad's gone. Yeah. Um, and so how many of you also... Uh, when your dad got home, knew that like it was coming to you, right? Yeah, you can relate. Um, and so I, I remember as I was uh, thinking of, of, of uh, uh, this story, I remember one time my dad went on a business trip to Arizona, um, and, and little Nathaniel was causing some trouble in the Kaufman house. And uh, so my dad came back, and uh, he didn't instantly come back and, and, and punish me, right? Because he hadn't seen me for a week. And so he came back, he comes you know, through the door, you know, he gave me a hug, told me they loved me, they missed me. Um, he gave me a, a gift, it was like a rock with a scorpion on it in Arizona, it was really cool, I loved it at the time, I was like 15. Um, <laughs> but he came in, you know, he did that first, and then he basically said, okay, now you're grounded for such and such amount of time, right? Um, it wasn't instantly to that. And so this is how um, the book of 1 Corinthians kind of starts out. Um, so Paul, in about 50 AD, had, had uh, first went to Corinth, the city of Corinth, and this is where he first preached the gospel. Um, and so this is, uh, this is, he's kind of the father of the Corinthian church. Um, at the time that he wrote our first Corinthians, he had already written at least one letter to the Corinthians, and we know that from Corinthians 5, where he mentions that he had previously wrote to them. Um, and so it's about five years later, and he finds out that there are some problems in the Corinthian church, and so he's writing to them again to address these issues. And if we skip ahead in chapter 1, we see this in verse 11. This is kind of the, the uh, reason for at least this first four chapters in 1 Corinthians. Um, talking about divisions in the church. He says, For it has been reported to me by Chloe's people that there is quarreling among you, my brothers. Um, so, so Paul realizes that there are issues, and so he is writing to the church. Um, but even though that there are lots of issues, Paul loves the church of Corinth. And so he doesn't jump right into the bad stuff. Um, he starts with his normal greetings and, um, and affirms the Corinthian church that he loves them by referring to them as brothers. Verse 10, I appeal to you, brothers, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so similar to uh, a father coming home after vacation and you're kind of bad, right? He doesn't jump right in, but you kind of know it's coming. And so that's kind of how Paul starts out. Ooh. And uh, so we'll, we'll jump in here at verse one and, and go through the greeting. So it says, Paul called by the will of God to be an apostle of Christ Jesus and our brother Sosthenes to the church of God that is in Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints together with all those who in every place call upon the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, both their Lord and ours. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So this is a pretty standard opening for Paul, um, referring back to his apostleship and his authority as an apostle of Christ, um, introducing who he is and what unites them, which is Christ in this moment. Um, then moving on into verse 4, um, it is typical for Paul to do a quick um, thanksgiving. And so he says, I give thanks to my God always for you because of the grace of God that was given you in Christ Jesus. 
that in every way you were enriched in him in all speech and all knowledge. Um, now, this is quite the compliment for the Corinthians. A little background on the, ta- on the uh, city of Corinth. It would actually be quite an understatement to call it a town. Um, Corinth was a massive, massive city. In fact, one of the biggest of its day. Um, it was a port city. Um, it was massively uh, wealthy. It had uh, actually the biggest uh, marketplace of any known city in the ancient world at that time. Um, they had giant arenas where they did um, uh, the, Ith- I'm going to say it wrong, Isthmian Games. I don't think I can even say it. Isthmian Games, something like that. Uh, it's kind of like the Olympics. Um, and they, they, did, they hosted these games. People came from all over. They had these giant arenas. Um, one of the arenas held 18,000 people. And then they had an, an indoor arena that held 3,000 people. Um, archaeologic, or archae- archaeologists have uh, seen that, that there are like wealthy uh, private neighborhoods, wealthy like uh, public and private dining, and just all of these things. It's a massive, massive city. And so um, I think sometimes we think of Paul when he's writing these letters kind of scribbling down on a rough piece of paper and it gets kind of sent out to a little village in the desert and, you know, a couple hundred maybe less Christians are reading it. This was probably not the case with the Corinthian church. Um, it was a young, a vibrant church, um, and with the, the, the city of Corinth being so wealthy and so well off, um, they had a lot uh, more time on their hands. And so some of the things that they valued um, more than just about anything were, um, were orators, people who were skilled in speaking, um, and then people who, who were wise, like wise teachers. And so they very much valued these things, even to a fault. And so Paul is very much complimenting them by saying, that, that in every way you were enriched in him in all speech and knowledge, but he re- references that uh, with the gospel because he says, even as the testimony about Christ was confirmed among you. So he says, basically, because of what your, your, your speech and your knowledge, we see that the testimony of Christ sunk in. We see that the roots of the gospel are, are in you and that, and that you are true believers. And so this is a big compliment. Um, Moving into verse 7, so that you are not lacking in any gift as you wait for the revealing of our Lord Jesus Christ, who will sustain you to the end, guiltless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful, by whom you were called into the fellowship of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Um, Verse 9 is also kind of key here, as Paul is about to begin um, kind of a series of harsher um, admonishments to the church. Um, He says, God is faithful, by whom you were called into fellowship of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. So he's saying, God is faithful. You were called to Christ. He's not giving up on you. There's some things that you need to fix. There's some things that are bad, some things that are going to come that he's going to address, but God is faithful. He hasn't given up on you just because of that. And so then moving on into verse 10, it says, I appeal to you, brothers, this is where we get into the, 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 the first part, the first issue, divisions in the church. I appeal to you, brothers, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be united in the same mind and the same judgment. And then the verse 11, for it has been reported to me by Chloe's people that there is quarreling among you, my brothers. And so this brings us to our first point is that Christ is preeminent in unity. Christ is above all. Christ is paramount. Christ is the most important part of unity within the church. And so um, a little Bible tip, and I've mentioned this before, when you're reading through the Bible, anytime you see things repeated, uh, a phrase or a word repeated in a passage, it means that something important is happening. Something important is being stressed. There's, there's a point here to this. Um, and the phrase or the word that Paul is repeating in these first 10 verses is our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To the church of God that is in Corinth, those sanctified, sanctified in Christ Jesus, the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Grace to you from God our Father, the Lord Jesus Christ. He mentions Jesus' name 10 times in 10 verses. And so I think that this is not a coincidence as Paul is about to move into talking about divisions in the church. He has just stressed beyond anything 10 times in 10 verses the name of Jesus Christ. And so Christ is the center of unity within the church. Christ is the one that brings us all together. Um, have any of you guys ever, uh, have any of you guys ever uh, looked at somebody or maybe like, or you've seen somebody or you get to know somebody a little bit and you're kind of just like, man, we could not be more opposites, right? And, and you might not be mean, but you just, you realize that you're like, man, we are not the same at all. And then you're kind of thinking, I wonder if they breathe air. And so you get over and you hear the, you're like, okay, they do breathe there. They do breathe there. We have that in common, right? Sometimes that's all you can find, right? 
And, and so we know it's kind of a joke, but we know that when people are really different, it's kind of hard to get along. And, and that was the, the Corinthian church would have been no exception to this rule. Um, with Corinth being such a massive city, such a massive place of, of, of trade and business and, and ships coming in and out and all of these things, um, th there was a massive uh, diversity of, uh, of, of everything, of every type. And so in the church, there would have been a, a, large, uh, a large amount of people from different uh, previous religious backgrounds, different ethnicities, um, different uh, economic statuses, different interests, different likes, some of them go watch the games, some of them don't, whatever that is, they would have had a lot of diversity in their church. And so we know that, that, that with a lot of diversity, unity is harder, right? But what is it that makes us unify as people? What is it that makes us unify? Um, have you ever walked into a room, kind of different scenario, and you're kind of, you know, maybe you got dragged there by somebody else, and you're kind of just like, man, this is not the place for me, I do not like these people. I feel like I don't fit in at all. And then all of a sudden you hear some guy in the back whisper, oh man, yeah, I was bummed that the Broncos didn't win. And you're like, oh, the Broncos, I love the Broncos. I was bummed too, right? And so you go and you have a conversation with that person, right? It, it's, it's these little things that we're passionate about that unite us together. And we see this with all different types of groups, right? Whether it's a political group or, or an interest group or a sports team or whatever it is, there's always just this one kind of powerful thing that everybody is passionate about that brings everybody together, right? And for Christians, for us, for the Corinthians, this was Jesus Christ. If, if we can bond so much, if we can have this instant kind of unity with somebody who likes the same sports team as us, or, or is in the same uh, major of school as us, or likes the same, insert anything else, likes fishing. I can bond with anybody who likes fishing, I can tell you that much. Um, if we can do that, how much stronger is our bond with those who have the same things in common with us that are of an eternal perspective, right? Right? Jesus Christ is the one person that can unify all of us as human beings because he brings together the things that we all have in common. As human beings, we're all sinful and we all cannot pay the price for our sins. And so we're all in need of a savior, right? And then Jesus and his sacrificial death on the cross provides a way out, a salvation for us. And so that, I believe, is what Paul is communicating here, is that though there are divisions in the church, Jesus Christ is paramount. Jesus Christ is what unites us all together. Jesus Christ and his sacrificial death on the cross as an atonement for our sins, that's what brings us together. That's what gives us true unity. And so how do we apply this practically there's divisions in the church, and we'll get into the specifics of it later, but there's divisions in the church. Paul is calling for unity. In verse 10, the word unity, or united, um, it says, let there be no divisions among you, but that you be united in the same mind and the same judgment. I mentioned fishing a, sec a couple seconds ago. This word united is really cool because it's also used in the book of Matthew as a term describing mending fishing nets. And so again, I think that's cool because it's fishing. But mending fishing nets... And so we get this image, and I think it's really cool because the fishing net is a tool that does something, right? It's made for a specific purpose. And we know that as Christians, we are God's workmanship. We are Christ's workmanship. We are Christ's tool on earth to, to carry out his plan on earth. And so if we're a, kind of a fishing net, we're all different, and we're all these cords coming down for this fishing net, right? Um, but then there's, there's holes because it needs to be mended. There's holes in this church. There's divisions among us. And Paul is saying that we need to take away those divisions. We need to be united. And the way to do that is through Jesus Christ. And so the way that we practically do this, I think, is focusing on the essentials of our faith instead of the details. And, and, and I don't mean this to say that doctrine isn't important or, or that, you know, even getting down to some of the very uh, nitty gritty details of your faith is not important. Um, but in a large group of believers, there's going to be some variance, right? But we all have these couple things in common. Jesus Christ is God. Jesus Christ paid the sacrifice for our sins and his atonement on the cross. And we need him to be his to be saved, right? And we've placed our faith in him for our salvation. Those are the things that we can all agree on as brothers and sisters in Christ. 
And so, uh, so kind of taking a step back and, you know, we're always going to have these disagreements, but sometimes the disagreements don't, don't make any difference. And so one quick example is, you know, maybe you have like for a doctrinal disagreement or something, maybe you have one person on one side that, you know, believes um, in, in uh, unconditional election. And so what that is, is that, that we are dead in our sins and, and we can do nothing without the Holy Spirit's help in our lives to realize our need for a savior. And then maybe we have somebody on the complete opposite side who says, well, no, we can realize it and Christ has provided his salvation for us and we need to use our free will to accept it. Pretty vastly different sides, right? But if we take a step back, what is the practical application of this? Because we all still agree that Jesus is God, his sacrifice is what pays the price for our sins, and we have to put our faith in him to be saved. We all still agree on that. And so practically speaking, couldn't be more different, these two sides, but practically speaking, when we get down to it, we all can agree on what we do with that knowledge, right? We can all agree that we are supposed to spread the gospel and we're supposed to, to live faithfully unto death. And so what I want to ask you guys to do is, is and, and this is just one example of division. Division can be from lots of different things. Um, but I want to ask you guys to, to take a step back sometimes, you know, if an argument is getting heated or whatever it is, and, and try, to, try to focus on the essentials of our faith and then focus on how does this practically affect us? How does this practically affect the church? Every group has diversity in it, but as a group, we can be unified by one powerful drive, and that drive is Christ and his salvation that he has provided for us on the cross. Unity is desired, and we find that through Christ. Okay, so moving on into our second point, uh, and it's our last point, message over the messenger. Message over the messenger. Um, so, so moving in, Paul gets more specific in what these divisions specifically, or at least this section of divisions, are. Verse 12, what I mean is that each one of you says, I follow Paul, or I follow Apollos, or I follow Cephas, or I follow Christ. And so apparently, um, Paul is addressing an issue where uh, people were aligning themselves with particular people instead of aligning themselves with Christ. But then at the same time, Paul also mentions a group, a fourth group. So there's Paul, uh, Cephas, who is actually also Peter of the twelve. And, uh, and Apollos, but then he also adds in the group, I follow Christ. And at first glance, you're like, well, isn't that what we're supposed to do? Um, but apparently, we don't know any details, but apparently this fourth group had also um, adopted the spirit of partisanship and was creating divisions in the church as well. And so he lumped them in there too. Um, but what's interesting is all three of these people um, have a long uh, and, and valid history within the early church. Um, Paul, specifically chosen by God to carry the gospel to the Gentile world, right? Um, Peter, probably if you had to pick one, the leader of the 12, you know, the one that jumped in there and, and, and went for it all the time, even if he did put his foot in his mouth. Uh, but was with Jesus through his whole ministry. Apollos, we know from uh, the book of Acts that he was actually a very gifted speaker and a very gifted debater, and he was known to go through the Old Testament scriptures and prove that Jesus Christ was Lord. And so all three of these, these people, um, very good to, to follow, right, or to listen to their teachings. But the problem is that the Corinthians had allowed this to become a division in the church. And so they were picking the message, the messenger over the message. And they had elevated the messenger over the message, which is the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so Paul is going to have none of this. And so he fires back with three quick questions. He says, is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized into the name of Paul? So Paul jumps in here, um, clearly disowning those who would align with, with his own faction, apparently. Um, he says, come on, guys, seriously, did I die for you? Were you baptized into my name? Christ's sacrifice is what provides us salvation. You're baptized into the name of Christ. And so Paul quickly um, shuts this down as he is having none of this uh, partisanship. One thing that I think is interesting to note, though, is that Paul doesn't condemn the teachings of any of these people, right? He doesn't say, you know, uh, don't, you know, follow me, but follow Christ, but my teachings are the best or anything like that. He doesn't condemn the teachings of Peter. He doesn't condemn uh, the, the teachings of Apollos or of himself. Um, all three of these men were probably teaching sound, not probably, were teaching sound uh, doctrine. They were teaching the gospel. 
And I think that that's kind of relevant for us to think about today as we think about times that we might be tempted um, or a little bit elevating the messenger above the message. Um, I brought a couple books with me. We'll start with this. How, how many of you guys have some favorite theologians or, or preachers? Na- name them off. Yell them out. Who do you like? Who? John Calvin. John Calvin. Okay. John Piper. John Piper. John Wesley. Tozer. Louis Giglio. Anybody like David Platt? Yeah, yeah. Francis Chan. C.S. Lewis. John Piper. Ravi Zacharias, yeah? We got some good ones, right? Some good ones from a couple hundred years back, some good ones from now. Those are all from mainly now. Um, C.S. Lewis. Uh, we've got some good ones. And, 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 you know, obviously Paul would probably uh, have a more complete version or have some things, some, some things to pick at um, from any of these people, but he might not actually condemn any of them. All the ones that we kind of mentioned, they're all good teachers. They're all teaching the Bible with a clear conscience, right? But how often do we kind of align ourselves with a specific preacher or theologian? And I think what it kind of comes down to is, is not that we like read everything that Francis Chan ever writes, but I think it's, it's more of the mindset switch in the sense of if you watch a sermon by Francis Chan and then the first thing you say afterwards is, wow, he's, he's a good preacher, Man, he is talented. Man, Francis Chan really knows how to preach. Francis Chan really knows how to engage the crowd, right? Instead of whatever he said. And and none of those things are wrong to say, but the mindset is kind of slowly switching to elevating the messenger above the message. And we'll kind of get back to that a little bit. Moving on into verse 14. Paul says, I thank God that I baptized none of you except Crispus and Gaius, so that no one may say that they were baptized in my name. I did, also, I did baptize also the household of Stephanus. Beyond that, I do not know whether I baptized anyone else. Um, so we don't know exactly why, um, but it's clear that he's speaking to people who are baptized because they're bragging about it. Um, but it apparently was not Paul's, uh, Paul's practice to baptize people personally. Um, the only other really reference to that possibly um, in the New Testament is in Acts chapter 10. Um, it, it seems that Peter preaches to a large group of people and then delegates uh, baptism to someone else. Um, that's kind of all there really is on that. But, uh, but he's actually thanking God that he didn't baptize them or more of them, which is very funny or very interesting because he's actually saying this division is so bad. I'm actually glad that I personally didn't baptize some of you so that this wouldn't create more division among you because they're saying, oh, I was baptized in the name of Apollos. I was baptized in in the name of Peter. I was baptized into Paul. These things, these were what was creating, this was what was creating division. And it's so wrong because we just talked about how, how Jesus Christ is what unifies us all together, right? Paul's own teachings on baptism in Romans chapter six is that uh, we are united with Christ in his death, burial, and resurrection through baptism. And so if the way that we are united with Christ is also the way that we we are creating divisions in the church, it's horribly wrong. And so Paul is calling this out. Verse 17, he says, for Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel and not with words of eloquent wisdom, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. So again, back to the Corinthians, uh, they, 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 they uh, held very highly, too highly, um, the, the art of speaking, the art of entertaining, the, the wisdom, the masterful orators of the day. And so Paul says, you know, I didn't even come to you like, I would, like, you, know, like you would like me to do, speaking with, with, with uh, big words and wisdom and eloquent uh, phrases and whatnot, because he didn't want to take the focus off the message and put it onto the messenger, I, uh, I, I, fall for, I fall for sales pitches sometimes. Um, I could be sitting on a, on a couch uh, stuffed after Thanksgiving dinner and Burger King commercial comes on and I'm like, man, I could go for a burger right now. Um, so much so, Hannah will attest that, uh, that it's like, it's really bad, it's everything. Um, we had a guy come up to our, we had a guy come up to our, our, uh, our house the other day. Um, and I usually try to avoid salesmen because I know I want to buy something if they give a good pitch. Um, but I opened the door, I'm like, hey, how's it going? He's like, hey, who's your internet through? And I'm like, uh, I don't even know, to be honest, like, we have internet. Um, 
And he's like, okay, okay. He's like, do you like it? I'm like, yeah, it works. Never thought about it. Like signed up once, never thought about it again. He's like, okay, okay. Uh, well, uh, what if I told you that, uh, he's like, how much are you paying? I tell him, he's like, what if I told you that for $5 more, I could give you cable and your internet would be 10 times faster. I'm like, oh, 10 times faster. <laughs> now, I have no idea what 10 times faster internet actually does when my internet does whatever I need it to do. I mean, you guys could probably tell me, but I don't know what that even translates into, but I'm, I'm already almost hooked, 10 times faster. Um, and then he kind of goes on, he's doing his blurb, he's doing his pitch, and, and he kind of sneakily throws in there, he's like, yeah, I'm the best salesman in the region, and I'm like, oh, the best salesman in the region. Now I'm like, really, like, I wanna buy from the best salesman in the region. <laughs> like, this guy's good, he's reeling me in. And uh, I finally was able to hold off and I got him to leave and I went inside. I'm like, hey, Hannah, we should uh, probably get that internet. And she's like, no, it's not gonna do anything different. I'm like, okay, fine. And then every, like for the last six months, every time we get a little blip or something, I'm like, hey, best salesman in the region, we could have had that. <laughs> um, but I bring this story up to show the example that um, I had kind of elevated, and not kind of, I really did, because I have no idea what I would even be buying. I elevated the sales pitch. I elevated the, the, the sales pitch and the, the speaker or the delivery over the product, right? And this is what the Corinthians were doing here. They were elevating the message, er, the messenger over the message. They were saying, I follow Paul when they should have been following Christ. They were saying, I was baptized into Paul when they were baptized into Christ. And, and, you know, I think that we do this too. We do this with these, these big name speakers, right? We have all these, these awesome uh, preachers and all these awesome theologians nowadays. Um, and I think it's awesome. You know, I, I really get pumped up when I, I watch a preacher who can um, communicate something that would probably be over my head um, in a simple way that I can understand and is engaging and all of these things. I, I love it. Um, and I think that that's good and that's fine. Um, but I think that we need to, sometimes we need to evaluate how much effort we're putting into kind of extra biblical sources as opposed to actually reading the Bible. Um, and then on the opposite end, I think that sometimes we're the perpetrators, or at least we, we, uh, we, we clap and smile and say that was good, and we kind of enable um, the perpetrators. Because I was thinking about this, and I was like, you know, how, how often do we do this for any ministry, for any church? How often do we do this too? How often do people come out of a church service and they're like, man, that service ran really well. Or man, that preacher was really good. Or wow, the music was like professional. And those things aren't bad. I'm not saying that Christians can't be professional and can't do things well and can't do things good. But I often wonder if sometimes we're doing things a little too flashy, if we're, we're doing things a little bit too much, too big, and we're taking away from the focus, which is Christ, which is his sacrificial death on the cross for our sins. Sometimes we distract from the message. And so how do we apply this? Um, I want to challenge you guys to examine your spiritual intake. Examine your spiritual intake. And, and I've kind of said this before, but I think that we live in an age where, where there's so much information available. There's so many different preachers that we can listen to, and they're all talented. You know, they're kind of the best of the best, right? Um, there's so many different books of theologians with very smart people that we can read. Um, and that's all good. But I think that we need to um, examine our spiritual intake. And so if, if, we're reading, if we're reading Francis Chan, Crazy Love, and I'm actually about halfway through right now too, so I'll take my own advice. Um, if we're halfway through Crazy Love, but we realize we're, we're reading this for maybe an hour a week or something, and, um, and then we're listening to a couple kind of Christian podcasts over the week, a couple hours there, um, but then we come to our Bible reading, we realize, oh, I'm lucky to get a chapter or two in a week. Um, maybe we're, we're, we're starting to elevate the, message, the messenger over the message. Maybe we need to cut a little bit of that out and start focusing on God's word a little bit more. You see, if we elevate the messengers above the message, we will have disunity in the same way that the, Christ, the Corinthian church had disunity. And it was causing problems. It was tearing holes among them. If Christ is not preeminent, we will also have disunity. Jesus Christ, his sacrificial death on the cross that has provided a way for us to escape from our sins, for us to have salvation if we put our faith in him. That has to be the powerful driving force that unifies us as a diverse group of people. Let's pray. 
Dear Heavenly Father, God, we thank you so much for everything that you've given us. We thank you for your son and his sacrifice on the cross for our sins. God, we thank you for Paul and his um, contributions to the New Testament that we can learn from. Um, God, we thank you for uh, strengthening him to not uh, run with the people who wanted to, um, to be part of his faction that he could have self selfishly jumped onto. God, I pray that we would seek for unity over disunity and that we would put you first in all things. I pray this in Jesus' name, amen.